Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 130, featuring the second part of my interview with the graphics designer, Mark Soderwall. In this part of the interview, we talk about what does it mean to be a great graphics designer? and What should the relationship be between the guys doing the graphics and the people working on the rest of the game? Uh, Mark's got a lot of great ideas about best practices. I think you'll find it really interesting stuff. I know I did. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Mark Soderwall. All right, Mark, so let's get into a little bit of your gaming past, your gaming history. I know you, you sent me an email and you said that you used to play these coin-op games until your fingers bled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just wondering, uh, what were these games? And you know, that, That's a really different uh, I format that you're working with I, now. I literally did daycare um, at an arcade. It was called the Electronic Corral, and it was uh, in Lakewood, California, um, at one of the malls there, Lakewood Mall. And, uh, you know, my, my mom... Um, you know, would every now and then, you know, it'd be like this this favor. I'd get to get dropped off, you know, at the electronic, you know, corral, and she'd give me five bucks, and I'd use maybe a dollar of it, um, you know, because I would just there was a certain amount of games that I would just play that I knew I was good at. One of those was Robotron 2084. All right, oh, I just love that game. I I sweat playing that game, and I ended up having to leave the game because I just. Either my mom would come to pick me up and there just would be plus one, 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 one men still left on the screen lives. It's like I couldn't die enough. And so half the time I ended up leaving the game to some other kid that was waiting in line, you know, and he got a free game with about 20 lives. And it was really great because it was very repetitive, um, you know, which which was which was good for me. It wasn't a very deep. Uh, immersive story driven game it was very fire and forget which I which I kind of liked uh, a lot of the other games were like Tempest and Defender you know the classics I mean you're, you're shaking your head up and down um, you know, heart so, attack inducing games <laughs> oh yeah and you know it's just they're just fantastic but the thing about all these games that I'm talking about they all dealt with speed you know you had to be very quick and very reactionary it was very Twitch gaming, you know, what we consider Twitch gaming now, that was Twitch gaming then. Um, and so I, you know, I wasn't into really, because I was just, I was a kid, so I, I like things to be very fast and, and, you know, intense, very intense. So I would, I would gravitate to those games, but then all of a sudden, Dragon Slayer came out. This fully animated laser disc, you know, gaming experience. I was just like, this is fascinating you know, wow, an actually story-driven, art-driven type of, you know, I saw it at a fair once, and I couldn't believe my eyes. I mean, it was, it was amazing. Um, and so I fell in love with, with that genre for a while, and Space Ace came out, and I'm like, oh, keep it coming. Um, and, uh, you know, a slew of other games came out from there, and, yeah, it was just a, it was a great experience. And so, I mean, I, like I said, I, I started gaming at a very, very young age. Um, but never thought for a minute that I'd actually, you know, be where I am now. It never even dawned on me, but I'm glad it happened. Yeah, I was wondering about that. So how did you uh, get involved in the art and the, you know, the graphics part of this? Did you just like to draw? Are you nat naturally talented in that way? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've got a talent towards drawing. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of other people out there that are better than me, um, no question about it. Um, but I do love design. I love uh, my real passion is is really character in foreground type of art. Uh, you know, environments. You know, I just I don't know. Environments took too long <laughs> for me. Again, I always seem to come back to this ADD thing. Um, but it's just like you know, characters. I was able to realize them pretty quickly. You know, and and they held a lot of personality for me because they had you know two eyes and nose and a, and a mouth, something that I could relate to very quickly. Whereas environments, not saying that environments don't have character. Please, environment artists, I'm not, I'm not coming against you at all. It's just it took a while to realize a lot of that. There was a lot of mood. There was a lot of lighting. There was a lot of composition. Um, you know, and that was just like, whew, you know, God, it just seems like it's going to take so long. Um, you know, where I had a friend of uh, at Blizzard 
that uh, was telling me who's an environment artist and we got on this we got on this kick and he was just like mark what's the biggest character on the screen <laughs> and i'm like environment and so he's like exactly <laughs> so you know it kind of put me in my place and, and humbled me a bit but um you know the talent was there to draw but the talent to be able to draw digitally really wasn't because uh you know this is back in the, uh, the early 90s you know photoshop uh really hadn't come out until like the mid 90s i believe um you know or the, the early 90s to some degree um so it was all d-paint um d-paint animator these 8-bit programs um and right out of high school when i graduated in 89 um my teacher uh, my art teacher submitted two uh, pieces of mine to an art competition and uh, a local art competition entered me as an amateur and uh, I didn't think they would they would have a snowball's chance in hell of winning but they did one of the pieces won first place one of the judges on the panel happened to you know uh, work for Nintendo or, or do Nintendo games he called me up a couple of days later um, and said, Mark, would you be interested in, in coming down for an interview at the studio? And, you know, would you be interested in doing artwork for video games? I said, I'd love to do that. I, I don't know how. It's like, it's okay. We'll teach you. We'll teach you how to do it. And so that was fantastic. And so uh, the interview went really well. And like I said, we get back to, uh, you know, talking about the story of creating artwork on graph paper, <laughs> you know, because, uh, you know, it was back for Nintendo Entertainment you know, systems, you know, before is even the Super Nintendo. Um, yeah, and so that's kind of how, how it all snowballed from there. The tools just kept getting better. Uh, Photoshop's came out and the painters came out and, you know, R1, R2 of Autodesk and, you know, Discrete and then Maya and Max and Alias and, you know, all of these tools, it just, it just kept getting better and better, um, which allowed me, as well as many other guys and girls, to realize artwork at a level that that you're seeing today that is hyper real. So, Mark, as, as somebody who's had such a successful career in, in working with art and graphics, I just you know have to know: Are you just born with this, or if, so, if somebody has trouble uh, drawing, is this something they can somehow learn how to do? Well. <laughs> You know, there's there's nothing that can take the place of, of traditional art, of, of having just the ability. I mean, there's there's a myriad of tools out there in filters and shaders and effects um, that a lot of the software applications uh, provide for you. You know, and as long as you really, I mean, artwork, a lot of times people think, well, artwork is you've got to be able to draw. That's only a, that's only a percentage of it. There's composition. You know, there's there's lighting, there's framing, there's telling a story visually. Um, you know, I mean, you look at uh, you look at storyboard artists, and you know, some storyboard artists, uh, you know, realize very intense, very immersive types of illustrations. Then there's some storyboard artists that, I mean, they're chicken scratching, you know, and it, it just looks like poo on a page, but they're telling a story. You know, they're trying to convey depth they're trying to convey action and motion and pacing um so again art is is subjective right art is in the eye of the beholder beauty is in the eye of the beholder i think really what it comes down to is if you're able to communicate an idea um and then maybe at least communicate that idea to somebody else that can create something beautiful from it you know you you know that's competitive that's marketable you might not necessarily be the best artist in the world, um, technically, but like I said, really it all comes down to communication. And if you're able to communicate that idea in, in some capacity that's objective, um, that can get other people excited and on board with vision, somebody's going to hire you. I mean, yeah. You know, we were talking earlier, you've got so many titles under your belt. It's, it's Obviously, we can't talk about them all here. Uh, but I was really curious, you know, when you, this uh, very first job that you got into, we were talking a little bit about this uh, company called Color Dreams, and, you know, you were working with graph paper to these pixel, uh, I mean, the crudest uh, conditions imaginable, right? So I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that. Well, you know, it's so funny that you, you mentioned graph paper. You know, we were dealing with, with you know, 8-bit um, you know, colors, 256 colors. And a lot of times it was only really 255 colors because, uh, 
we usually had to uh, leave a color that was like an alpha color, um, you know, like a, a bright green or a bright pink that uh, the engineers would tell the, you know, tell the software to ignore, you know, so, so, um, you know, we would get, we would get nice edges and, and whatever, but, uh, you know, <laughs> working on graph paper was a real challenge, but it was, you know, it was, it was way back in the early nineties and, uh, you know, it was all relative, um, you know, uh, to then we thought it was cutting edge, right? So, you know, we're building a character and we're only given like 12 pixels high by maybe five pixels wide to realize, let's say Indiana Jones, you know, or, you know, some other type of character. So a lot of times we'd have only really two pixels for a head. We'd have a light flesh color and a dark flesh color underneath that. So we had a head and a neck and there you go. You know, we didn't go into the, the facial details, you know, or like the hyper real shaders and normal maps and parallax maps of games now where you can go into the pores of the faces and you can see the water on the eyes and the reflection and the refraction. We didn't have any of that. You know I mean? It was just like, so, you know, it was one thing to draw, you know, this, this little pixeled character, but then the real magic came when uh, it got animated. So all of a sudden, it's just like, you know, life got breathed into this, this little, this little pile of mush and it started moving around and you're like, oh my gosh, wow, it, it actually has personality. You know, you, for the lack of information you had by way of pixels to convey emotion, you had to make up an animation. So it's like, I couldn't tell from just a solid flesh colored pixel if the character was happy or sad. The only way I'd be able to tell he was happy is if the character was upright while he's walking or whatever, the only way I'd be able to tell if he was sad is if he was lunched over and he was moping and dragging his feet and had a lot of weight shifting to him. So it was really this great collaboration between artist and animator. Um, but back then, a lot of times the artist was the animator. So um, yeah, it was really, uh, it was really challenging. And it brings up an interesting uh, point I wanted to talk about too, is the relationship between the graphics of a game and the gameplay. You know, I've talked to some people who see the, they think of the graphics just as sort of window dressing almost, but, you mm -hmm. know, I don't think that's the right view, right? It's, isn't the, I mean, how do you describe, define or describe this relationship? Well, there was a, there's a lot of techniques that you use um, when you're building out, uh, when you're building out uh, art and design for a game. You know, you, you initially come out with the design of the game, and audio has a big part to play in that as well, so, you know, I, I don't want to dismiss that at all. One of the things that, you know, we learned at Lucas that George was really about was the fact that 50% of the movie is visual, the other 50% is audio. And so that's why, you know, you've got Skywalker sound and that's why, you know, he'd, he'd work with, you know, really well-known composers because they, they help set the ambient, they help set a lot of mood that just complements the visuals. Um, in games, it's a lot of the same, where you, you have a particular type of design especially let's say a very open world game, there still has to be a way to breadcrumb the player along to where they don't get overwhelmed or that they're going to the point of interest that they need to go in order to feel like they're um, progressing and not just wandering like the Israelites in the wilderness, you know, or something like that uh, in a game um, for 40 years. But, uh, you know, so we'll do a lot of things with color. We'll do a lot of things with lighting. Uh, it's typical. It's like you walk into a dark room. If there's a light somewhere, you go to the light. It's, it's just instinctive, you know, and I'm oversimplifying it, but you kind of get where I'm going. And so we, we utilize a lot of those fundamentals uh, in the game. A lot of color theory uh, we'll, we'll utilize as well. So we'll, you know, we'll, we'll trade out warm colors uh, from one environment and then start to taper them off to more muted and cold colors. And then I'll start to uh, give a mood and then if we obviously complement that with audio to where the music comes off of real high and now it's becoming off key and unsettling um, you know uh, there's only so dark that we can go with the art before players are just like wandering around and they're like oh god I don't know where to go you know like Doom 3 or something like that to where they've got a you know mod a light on the gun um, but uh, you know that's where sound comes in you know and that's where you you know, even though you don't have a large space by way of artwork or polygons in the model to make a large cave, you can still give the illusion of a large cave by having lots of echoing, lots of ambient, 
um, noises, you know, muffled in the background uh, to, you know, make this cave, which is actually very small, seem huge, you know, and give this sense of scale and just this ominous presence to the player to where it's just like, you know, it's foreboding or it's intimidating or something like that. So it's really important to make sure that you're playing nice with all the other communities in game development and that you're communicating so that everybody's on the same page and everybody's working their talents and their craft to the same end goal. It sounds like you have a psychology, a psychology of the player that you're keeping in mind. <laughs> exactly. Because the minute that, uh, the minute that something goes wrong, um, as subjective as it might be, the player will pick up on it. You know, it's just the same way that a lot of times, you know, uh, in animation, uh, if the animation isn't right, let's say, especially like on a human character, um, you know, the, the average gamer wouldn't really be able to tell you technically what's wrong with the animation, but they know there's something wrong. There's a hitch in the step. Uh, the weighting just doesn't feel right. You know, the character, the model is this very heavy, you know, ominous, you know, type of character, but they're just walking really fast, you know, and, and there's there's no lumbering, there's, there's no weight shifting um, there. And so these are the things, especially as a director, that I have to be very sensitive to as well, to making sure that all those little nuances, and they are little nuances, but they do add up, that uh, that's being uh, addressed and understood. And some of it does. Some of it gets away from me, and that's when I'm hoping that the, the guys and gals in, in quality assurance that are testing the games are picking up on this and you know helping us out. I want to you know, since we're talking about this, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here because sure. I, I think this is uh, relevant. But uh, we're, you know, you worked on the NBA, NBA Live uh, mm -hmm. game, and I, I read a quote from you about how you uh, you really put a lot of thought into making the uh, the models of the characters look like the actual people. Mm -hmm. And you know, this was, this was in the in the '90s. So first of all, I'm wondering, uh, did some of the players uh, get in touch with you about this? No, not I, really. Um, oh, okay, go ahead. And yeah, not really. I mean, if they did, uh, I never really heard uh, anything about it. And most of the time, again, uh, you know, players back then were so stoked to be in a video game. They really didn't care, you know, just as long as, you know, a black player looked black and a white player looked white. I think that's all they really, you know, I think that's the level of detail that they got to. It's just like, you know, oh, that looks great. You know, it's just like, no, make my eyes closer together and make my eyes further apart. Now, working on Terminator 3, that was a whole different subject. Schwarzenegger had a lot of things to say about it. <laughs> well, actually, it really wasn't Schwarzenegger as much as it was Schwarzenegger's agent um, that had a lot to say concerning that. But that we can talk about that later. But as far as NBA Live, um, no, the players didn't really, uh, you know, I mean, of course, everything was approved through a licensing process. So, you know, it, it went through another division. Um, that was alongside of mine and they would you know they would give feedback or, or something of that nature and then i would i would touch it up again or, or hand it off to another talent that would take those notes and, and address them um but yeah you know back then it was it was fairly new to be able to even show any kind of likeness of any kind of player um or professional in a game before so there really wasn't a benchmark right so uh, like i said it was just kind of uh Ignorance was bliss, <laughs> you know, and uh, they were just so excited just to see more or less the numbers on their jersey, let alone their faces in the game, you know. So uh, I don't think they, I don't think they fully realized just how much power that they had as far as by way of uh, being able to inject influence or change. Um, whereas nowadays, uh, people are very aware, and branding is so very important to professionals um, and actors and different things like that that. They've got a slew of legal teams and PR teams and agents that are very much looking out for their brand. And so the, the editing and the licensing and the approval process is arduous. I mean, that's a big word, but it's arduous. It's really complicated. Speaking of things that are really complicated, you know, I was, you know, I've, I've, I've read some about how uh, people just sort of have this innate pleasure when they see a likeness of something and they're able to recognize, oh, that's a, you know, that's so-and-so or that's a bird or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but there's something too, like the, uh, I think it's called Uncanny Valley. 
Oh, right. You know, that you get with these sort of Japanese robots. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, what's going on there? At a certain point, and then it just goes, boom. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how can something be too realistic? Um, well, I mean, definitely something can be too realistic. You know, it, it's so funny, and, and you know, I'm, I'm probably going to get a little bit of flack for this, but I still have a hard time watching things in HD, you know, um, just because it is so hyper real. I mean, when I'm when I'm watching Pirates of the Caribbean and, you know, I can see, you know, the makeup lines of Jack Sparrow's eyeliner, you know, um, and, and all of the little imperfections as well as the detail. But see the devil's in the detail. Right. So you do. You see all those little imperfections. You see uh, those things that, you know, maybe it's just old school that film covered up for me. Um, you know, I, I, maybe I'm just a product of my generation. Um but, uh, you know, even in games, it's like there's something to be said. And this is one of the things that I appreciate so much about director Ridley Scott. Um, you know, and he sat there and said, it's not it's not important to give uh, the viewer every detail. They need to make stuff up for themselves. You know, that's one of the reasons why Alien was so frightening. Ridley Scott purposefully on an interview talked about, I didn't want to show all of the alien. I wanted the viewer to make up the rest of what that creature was in their mind. Um, because what makes me afraid makes, you know, might be different from what makes you afraid. But if I have to fill in the blank for, for the rest of that, that alien was freaking scary, you know, and um, kind of the same way for games. It's like, yes, we have the ability to do, but does that mean we should? Um, and, and I believe that we shouldn't. I believe that there are certain things that, you know, just like reading a book that doesn't have pictures, you have to fill it in, you know, and it, I think it creates a little bit more immersion personally, because now you're investing some of yourself and your own imagination into a game. Um, and so I, I still think that that's very important. It's a very important technique not to necessarily show every detail. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. I, that's a big problem, I think, in a lot of games. Too too much information. <laughs> well, just because you can doesn't mean you should. I mean, that's right. really just a, it's a simple axiom right there. Well, let's uh, back up then, you know, quite, <laughs> you know, go way back. You know, I was, I was looking at this uh, list of your games, and I noticed that you've got a lot of uh, real-time strategy games, really like the very earliest, some of the very earliest uh, real-time strategy games. I was looking uh, Teagle's uh, Mercenaries. Is it Teagle or Teagle <laughs> Mercenaries? Uh, you know, the jury's still out. Um, you know, one of the designers on that uh, on that game, Daniel Burke, um, and his brother Steve Burke, uh, you know, two amazing talents that I actually learned a lot from uh, early on. Um, great guys. But, uh, yeah, Steve, or, I mean, uh, Dan Burke had uh, a lot of influence on this game. He actually wrote, wrote the score for the game, too. I mean, he's a really talented dude. Um but yeah, I don't, I don't know. It got Teagle, Teagle. I don't know. I, I didn't really care. I just had fun drawing the artwork. So. <laughs> this was, a, uh, was the game was it, was it inspired by Dune or had had the? Uh, I don't yeah. know. It was, I, I assume Dune was out. Well, Dune. I mean, Dune was a Dune crazy. Too. I mean, that was that was so much fun, you know. And, and uh, I think that was uh, I don't know. Was that before CNC? I think it was. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, Dune too. Yeah, was, uh, a couple of years before um, CNC came out. But, uh, you know, I really don't know uh, what really inspired the game because, you know, back then I wasn't a designer. You know, I was just an artist. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of got the tasks thrown at me or more or less the impressions from the designer. It's like, uh, you know, a sketch on the back of a, of a napkin or, you know, something of that nature. It's like, well, make something that looks like this and, and have it kind of have a mood of that. And, make it blue you know and so <laughs> there was a lot of freedom given and so I would, I would take those very subjective interpretations and do up some sketches and, and maybe throw some digital art together really quickly and get some feedback and so it's just this back and forth back and forth and you know unfortunately there weren't a lot of best practices um, towards game development as there are now um, you know artists weren't necessarily encouraged to look at the design doc uh, artists uh, weren't, and animators uh, weren't really given a lot of the story or premise. They weren't even really encouraged to play the game. Um, whereas now, I think if you don't do that, you're an idiot. 
Um, to be quite honest, I, I can't put it in more blunt. You're just stupid. Um, you need to, you need to understand the story. You, you need to play the game. You, you've got to have uh, an intimate knowledge as to what you're working on. You know, otherwise, how are you going to put any heart into it? How are you going to put any soul? How are you going to make that character come alive that's going to have any continuity to the story whatsoever? Um, and so I'm always encouraging artists and I'm always encouraging animators, understand the story, understand the level, understand the backstory. Um, you know, get into these characters, method method art, if you will, you know, to some degree. Um, you know, I'm always encouraging animators. It's like, get your butt out of the chair and walk around and, and feel what it's like. Get in front of a mirror, videotape yourself going through some of these movements and then have it up on the side of your desktop going in this window, cycling through till you really get it. You know, don't always try and just sit there and think of it in your head. If you've got the ability to do it and apply it in real life, and if motion capture is not available, then, you know, utilize some of these best practices. Um, so, sorry, I get really passionate about this stuff. So. Yeah, it sounds like, it sort of reminds <laughs> me of uh, Stan Lee and the, and the Marvel method <laughs> for comics. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with, familiar nope. with that. Yeah, I am. So yeah, it, exactly, exactly. So it's just uh, to me, I, I, again, uh, it's just a best practice. It's a way to really to really feel it and understand it. So I have a question here from Jay Barnson, uh, aka the Rampant Coyote, yeah. and he wants to know more about Siege. Uh, so what was what do you have to say about Siege all these years later? Uh, wow. Um, well, first it was, Siege was really difficult, uh, for me to get into because, you know, I was, I was still very, very new. I mean, wet behind the ears, new in the industry. And so I still really didn't have an idea or an understanding of what, what is tile graphics? What does that mean? What do you mean I make a corner piece and then that gets hooked to, uh, another you know horizontal piece that has another corresponding corner piece see i i just didn't get that because back then that just that was new it was it was brand new so there was a lot of trial and error that i went through and it was extremely frustrating um because there was no mentor there because everybody was learning it as well you know so there's and everybody was busy so nobody had time for the new guy you know to to get up to speed and so I had to learn a lot of this just by, you know, kind of secretly looking over the shoulder of, of another artist near me or, or whatever and trying to, trying to, you know, mine for information. Um, and Siege was a real challenge, it really was, but, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a great concept, it was a great premise. Um, we had a lot of freedom by how we were to build the characters. Um, one of the things that was really just... Um, prioritize was just make sure the characters look very different um, because again you're working with a small amount of information so color came into play huge you know you had to make sure that okay if if a uh, red colored faction is you know fighting another colored faction uh, you know don't have them be brown or tan you know I mean have them be purple or blue something so stark um, so there's no confusion because when you get a lot of those guys on the screen it gets nuts um, you know, so we were we were doing a lot of early kind of color theory um, and, and working with composition. Um, so it was it was a it was a real challenge. But really, what it came down to was making sure that the designers, these guys that actually built the levels, making sure that they had enough pieces to work with that would allow them to realize something very very pretty to look at and to to be able to mess around with. Um, so the user could have a great experience and not feel like they're playing the same level over and over. It's just, you know, these pieces would just been moved around. We wanted to make sure that every level had a, uh, a unique experience or a unique flavor, as it were. Um, so, yeah, it was fun. And that's all for this week's episode. I sure hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next time with a third part of my interview with Mark. A lot of great stuff coming up, so stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated to this show, contributed, uh, left a comment, or told somebody about it. All of those things uh, really mean a lot to me. I don't know, I don't know if you guys really appreciate uh, just how much it does mean to me. You know, of course, I'm, I'm not backed by any uh, big commercial company or anything. I just do this basically in my spare time uh, for fun. 
Uh, but I also like to think that uh, these shows are valuable, especially to somebody trying to learn the trade or somebody who just wants to know more about the history of games, get to meet some people, get to hear from people like Mark uh, Soderwall and uh, all the people that I've uh, interviewed over the years. <laughs> you know, wow, you know, it's been, it seems like uh, just yesterday I started this series. Uh, but anyway, I owe it all to you guys and I can't possibly thank you enough uh, for all your support. It means everything to me. I uh, do have some plans to thank you in a small way. You know, I won't reveal anything because I can't be quite 100% sure I'm going to be able to pull it off. But um, hopefully uh, all of my subscribers and people who've made donations, uh, I'll get a little something uh, to you soon. Um, I'll find a way to make it work. So anyway, I think you'll appreciate it. Uh, but if you haven't donated or uh, uh, subscribed, you might want to do that soon because I don't think you're going to want to miss out on this little surprise. Okay, so what about the, the ale of the week? Uh, what do we have here? I pulled out something very special uh, for the New Year's Eve episode. <laughs> it's not quite New Year's Eve yet, but uh, I still intend to enjoy this. This is a the Stoic. Uh, this is a, uh, let's see, a brew. It's a Belgian-styled quad of stirring depth and complexity. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about this one. Uh, let's see, this is brewed in by the Deschutes Brewery in Bend, Oregon. Oregon. <laughs> Holy cow, it says here that it's, uh, what is that, 16 point, with 16.5 percent being aged in old oak barrels. I was kind of curious if, uh, oh, the alcohol is 11 <laughs> percent. I still don't think that's as strong as that uh, one I had a couple weeks ago, but it's uh, nothing to sneeze at. Well, so anyway, let's open this up and, and give her a trial. Really? I love the bottle, you know, it's got this sort of waxy thing like a bottle of Maker's Mark, so now let's see if I can open this up and pour in the old uh, drinking horn. I've actually got no idea how you're supposed to open this thing. Uh, somebody's probably laughing at me right now. Let's try this little, little saw it comes on this bottle opener here. You know, I normally don't drag these sections out like this, but what the heck, it's the end of the episode and the end of the year, so anybody that wants to can always just exit the video. <laughs> you know, as I'm trying to hack at this, did I mention that I've got my game Thrustlifter finished and uploaded to Armchair Arcade? And I would really appreciate it, guys, if you would check that game out. You know, I tried my damnedest to make the damn thing fun to play. I know it's kind of a a big download, but I think you'll appreciate it. It took uh, me a long time to <laughs> finish that sucker. Okay, geez, I guess I'm gonna have to go for some heavier uh, utensils to get at this wax. Uh, so I'll be back in a minute. All right, I finally managed to get that <laughs> wax off of the bottle. I think I know why they call it the Stoic. You probably want to drink this before you drink anything else because otherwise you'll probably slit your wrist trying to open the damn thing. Anyway, let's uh, uh, give it a smell. That's a wonderful smell. Uh, it just smells like smells like flowers. <laughs> really nice. Very uh, very true to the Belgian uh, inspirations there. If I didn't uh, know any know any better, I think this was uh, straight from Belgium. Uh, let's give it a give it a sip here. I'm happy. <laughs> this is a damn, damn good ale. Holy cow, this is... Guys, uh, get yourself a bottle of this right away. Uh, this is the Stoic from Oregon. I think you're really be impressed. I know I am. <laughs> Let me get to the, uh, did I get to the quotation before I uh, enjoy much more of this beverage. Okay, the quotation this year is from the comedian Joey Adams, and it goes something like this. May your troubles last as long as your New Year's resolutions. See you guys next year. <laughs>